Welcome, everybody, to the Sports Experience Podcast. I'm your host, Dominic DiTola, with my co-host, Chris Quinn. And today, we're going to get into some good stuff. College football starting and all, and uh, good times to be had during this fall. And uh, we decided to do our subject on the national championship winning Nebraska football teams from the 1990s. Yeah, this dominant this dominant program from, you know, ni- I mean, they had a good team. We'll start it off in 93, but we're pretty much going 93 yeah. to 97. It's good to they start were, it in 93, yeah. honestly. Um, it's pretty much this uh, ta- uh, Tom Osborne era. You know, it's is uh, his career at right at the end. But really, in this is is his greatest achievements. You know? Yeah, um, Tom Osborne, one of college football's greatest coaches. Um, he took over for uh, Bob Devaney, who had won national championships in 1970 and 1971, you know, with Johnny Rogers, Heisman Trophy winner. Really good squads. And Osborne uh, had the fortune of coaching the 83 Nebraska team, which was undefeated but lost when he made the right decision to go for two in the Orange Bowl and not go for the tie, but they lost to Miami. Now, I thought that was interesting because you, you hear people say that that was the correct decision to go for the win, which so it's it's up for debate. It's but. up for debate. I mean, had he kicked the extra point and tied him, they would have won the national championship. Yeah. But you know what? I dig that. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I like the mentality of going for it. And that's the way I feel like football needs to be. Yeah, I mean, if it was overtime in that era, obviously you would have kicked the extra point and played for overtime because they were dominant. Yeah, Yeah. that's just not the way it was. They ended in these ties, which football, again, should not. There's something about ties in football without overtime. But we'll get into this this 93. uh, Yeah, because a decade later, kind of after being – Nebraska and Oklahoma kind of dominated the old Big Eight conference. Yes. And while Oklahoma was able to win national championships during that era, Nebraska would always come up short. Yeah, they were somewhat second fiddle to this dominant Oklahoma team. And then in the early 90s, Colorado started getting their you-know-what together under Bill McCartney, and they won a share of the national title in 1990 by beating Nebraska. And but by 93, Nebraska had started bringing in some really good recruits from outside of the state and they were undefeated 11 and 0 going into that year's orange bowl against the uh, Florida state Seminoles who were 11 and one led by Heisman trophy winner, Charlie Ward. Yes. And they uh, ended up losing this game, which if they won second field goal. Yeah. yeah. If they won, they would have been, uh, I would say four out of five national champions out of blows as opposed to three out of four, but we'll get into that too. Yeah. The, the third one. But I mean, it's one of those things where they were so good for this package of years in which it, it's almost like this five year string of the, they were the best team. And it's, and it's almost lost to history almost yeah, at this point. Because rem- a lot of teams don't bring it up. I mean, outside of the state of Nebraska, a lot of teams don't, or a lot of people don't bring it up. I, I knew of their back to backs, but I never really knew they were so dominant through this era where they really could have won five. I mean, that's. Yeah. A, the 96 season was the they had a couple of big hiccups but 93 they really could have won and mm. obviously we'll get into 94 right now yeah so 94 um for those of you who don't know um this was a very dominant team although they were beset by a lot of kind of issues as far as injuries and things like that um they started three quarterbacks that year yes uh their starter tommy frazier had blood clots um, Brooke Beringer, who was more their passing quarterback because they ran an option attack, he had gotten hurt and Matt Terman took some snaps, but they still averaged 35.3 points per game, which was eighth overall in the nation. And I mean, they were undefeated in the season, undefeated in Big Eight play. They had um, their defense was dominant. They called themselves the Black Shirts. Yeah, um, the defense was the. The 4-3 in that era that they were running was so dominant, and it was dominant 94 and 95 was the big. Yeah. The, the, this, the, they were slightly different teams, but they were so great against, like, they were really killing teams. They, they were they blowing were, them out. They gave up only in 94 12.5 points per game, which yeah. is third overall in the entire nation. I mean, dominant running attack led by Lawrence Phillips, over 1,700 yards. I mean... Like I said, though, not much of a passing team. They only had their leading receiver had 23 catches. Yeah, they had a great offensive line, though, and and that's what really built into their running team with with Lawrence Phillips, who 
Um, we'll get into later. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into next year. But um, I was I wanted to talk about the the quarterback uh, Tommy Frazier. Yeah, and, and his blood clots, and he has uh, what did he have? He had Crohn's disease. <laughs> Yep. And yeah. I thought it was interesting because he's one of the best college football quarterbacks. Oh, an incredible player. Um, in, I think it was like 2005, he was ranked like 33 out of the top 100. or You know what I mean? And was one of these early black quarterbacks. But every NFL team saw this possible possibility of blood clots and these Crohn disease and nobody drafted him. Yeah, he went up and played in Montreal, I think, in the Canadian League. Um but yeah, he was the team's leader. I mean, he yes. was the motherfucker in charge. 94, 95, he was the guy. Yeah. and uh, Even though they had to bench him. Yeah, they had to bench him because, you know, Beringer played well. And, um, you know, they rolled through their schedule. I mean, their closest uh, competition was really Colorado at that time because Oklahoma had been beset by uh, probation and suspensions and things like that. I was going to say they beat a really good uh, number two Colorado team on their way to this. And I thought I, I, when I'm researching this, I thought it was interesting because you grew up in Denver. So it must have been. Yeah, nobody liked Nebraska. Nobody liked Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, those games must have been extremely epic because Colorado was such a powerhouse and they were they were these pre national championship games that you saw that you were like, well, the winner of this is pretty much going to go on. Yeah, and l- much like Nebraska, Colorado was an option team. Cordell Stewart was their quarterback. Um, even as a Steelers fan, who oh boy, but they had ninety four Heisman Trophy winner, the late Rashawn Salam. I mean, yep, they were a very dominant team, and Nebraska handled them pretty easily. Yeah, that, that year. That's the thing that I I. Research, going back and researching this is there wasn't really many close games at all, like throughout this entire era. Yeah, I mean, really, Nebraska was led because in 94, four of their offensive linemen made first team all big eight. And four of them, I mean, from this team alone, as far as the aggregate, 36 guys signed NFL or NFL Europe contracts, Yep. which on a team of what, 88 people, that's a third of your roster being able to play yeah I mean, I, more than a third almost half which is crazy yeah to think that so many of these players were pro ready and they really were that's that's the thing about this nebraska team it was almost like a team of pros playing against a team of college kids you know exactly yeah and i mean a lot of it you know a lot of the offensive linemen they had during this era kind of washed out in the nfl yeah but they were able in college to get away with being just so much bigger and so much stronger than their competition and really set up a really good running game for them and like you said there were a lot of blowouts but during this era leading up to 94 everybody was talking about tom osborne in nebraska like a yeah but yes that was always what they referred to as yeah, they're dominant, but they're not breaking through against these Florida schools in these bowl games where everything's on the line. Yeah, they're not having the national championship seasons, the undefeated, the 12-0, and the 13-0 and seasons. Yeah, and what ended up happening, they win their first 12 games, and they're matched up against the University of Miami. In Another the Florida bowl. team. Another Florida team. That's what I feel like everybody playing for the national championship was playing one of these Florida teams. You know what I mean? If yeah. it was Colorado one year, they were like, well, we're playing Florida state. It was, that's when the, the Florida football was dominant. And I hate to say it, but I bet that's when the steroids in there were. Well, I mean, rampant. Flor- uh, Miami's defense that year was stacked. You had Ray Lewis, yep. Warren Sapp, and they, Warren- ta- they talk about that. Yeah. And they had uh, the rock. Yeah, they were talking about in the bowl game how Lawrence Phillips, Ray Lewis on one play hit Lawrence Phillips so hard that when Lawrence Phillips got back up, he's like, you're going to have to drag me off the field today. And Ray Lewis turns to Warren Sapp and goes, oh, we're in trouble. Yeah. We're in trouble. Yeah, no, it's it's this era of these this great defense in Florida. You're right. And, and uh, a yeah. great running game in Nebraska. And, you know, strength against strength. Uh, Miami had a very interesting backup defensive lineman. Sap replaced. Uh, his name was Dwayne Johnson. Yeah, Dwayne the Rock. Whatever happened to that guy? Uh, I think he's running for president. I'd vote for him. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But no, um, so in this game, uh, Frazier doesn't even start. Beringer starts yeah. and plays relatively well. Well, this is, I want to say this about Tom Osborne was they talked about him playing different quarterbacks in different situations and not being afraid of that. No, he was like, what's, what are we looking to do here? Yeah. What are what's we looking to make do? our team better? What are the matchups? Things like that. And he, he did it in a way that 
something that could cause a lot of controversy, he made it work for them. Yes. And that he made it work so well that it was, why would you question it? Exactly. That's why it was so great because everybody would question that double option, the, the not starting your starting quarterback throughout kind of thing. But the way he did it and the way their offense was set up, this is why I found the, the highlights to be so interesting was the way that their offense was set up was so designed to beat Miami. It was. And even though they were down 17 to seven in the second half, yep. they stuck when they put Frazier back in that last time, because he was flip flopping them when they put Frazier back in that big offensive line, because Miami's defensive line, if you don't know, it was based on the Jimmy Johnson old defense of the four three gap shooting. So Quickness. your your defense, yeah, your essentially your defensive line is former high school tight ends and linebackers. Yeah, and by the end of the game, because Nebraska had kept it close, they were really able to gash them a lot. And by the end of the game, it was twenty four to seven or twenty four to seventeen, and Nebraska had won their first national championship in. 23 years well i thought it was interesting that the defense held them to no points oh i mean they, it, they it had was, a, they had a dominant defense yeah i mean the, that's because a lot of people give it to this offense finally coming through but man the defense holding them to no points second half pretty much was what made them national champions that year like ed stewart defensive lineman big eight defensive player of the year dante jones played for the steelers in the nfl was an out, uh, outside linebacker any and player that gets drafted by the steelers or plays from dom's gonna bring up i will because because i know yeah. uh darren williams was a great cornerback for the packers for a long time yeah. he was probably the best player on that defense and uh yeah, Ty or Tyrone Williams, excuse me. Uh, Baron Miles was the safety on that team. Oh, okay. But yeah. yeah, Tyrone Williams is a really good player for Green Bay. And they really kept that pass happy Miami offense in check. And they broke through. Finally, they had broken through. And the thing about that 94 team was a lot of that team was coming back the, f the next season in 95. I was going to say, because this is something that I find so interesting about the commitment that these guys have to these teams is they literally say, hey, I'm going to play this next year for free and possibly injure myself and not go on to play pro. And it's one of those things where you see it, the backlash in in uh, basketball, but you really didn't see the backlash in football no. where guys would stay four years and their commitment to the to these programs were, I mean, you see the fruit that gets – harvested from this you know what i mean oh like, no i mean and nebraska is a good example of this because yes. they've always been a pro walk-on program and they've always been a pro strength and development program to where guys will sometimes stay five years because they'll redshirt their first year yep. and put on the necessary weight so that they can compete as redshirt freshmen mm -hmm. so if you have a guy staying four years leaving as a redshirt junior it's still four years yeah. i mean and even and, that was rare at well that's time. the thing is is they're they're ready for the nfl that's why so many of them from this team got drafted like right out it, it's it's really impressive the the way that their program was built yeah and it was built at that time what osborne started to do and we'll go into this later in the off-field stuff they really started recruiting Florida heavily. Like Williams was a Florida guy. Frazier was a Florida guy. He had realized to compete with these SEC and, you know, Florida schools, they're going to need team speed in addition to the power. And it was just this nice little era where it all came together for their program. Yeah. I find it interesting that the uh, recruitment from Florida was has always been so high. And yeah. for some reason, they're just – they produce – great football players in florida well that's how miami resurrected their program they just exclusively recruited everything south of the panhandle yeah so and they're like you want to play with your friends yeah <laughs> like yeah i do exactly and it, it i find i find that one interesting we might have to get into the grassroots of uh, florida football one time oh definitely um but yeah let's uh 94 champions let's get into 95 95 but which a lot of people consider one of the greatest single season college football teams ever well they say if you're putting a team up against somebody you're putting them up against you know what i mean like they're in the top three kind of thing is what everybody uh says about this team and if you look at the 
way they were handling like i thought they were crushing teams in 94 yeah they are crushing them in 95 i got some interesting stats here yeah i know you do you're a stat man yeah well they lead the nation in scoring which okay i get it do you know what do you know how many points they were averaging a game that season i don't know how many they averaged but i know they scored over 800 53.2 points per game (laughs) but not only that their defense still dominant yes ranked fourth giving up 14.5 that's almost a 40 point differential per game i want to know and this is something that i saw because of the asu team i'm a asu i'm about to graduate from there so i got to shout them out and i will in 96 but i want to see because they i think they scored 63 points against them in the first half yeah they shellacked them and it was 63 nothing i want to know how many points get scored after they essentially are like this game's over we're sub you know what i mean like yeah. because i feel like their defense would have been like number 1 number 2 if they had close games oh yeah they probably would have yeah. honestly but you're playing backups at that point. Yeah, they're playing backups second and half. That's here's an here's an interesting. Uh, this this proves how talent rich this team was. Yeah, Lawrence Phillips. We're going to get into his off field stuff. But yes. he was the consensus Heisman Trophy favorite. They play Michigan State and beat him fifty to ten. Nick Saban's first game at Michigan State, and he's talked about this. He's like. I was defensive coordinator for the Cleveland Browns, you know, came off a success, uh, successful uh, tenure over at Toledo. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at this team and I'm like, this is a pro team. I don't know if I'm ever going to win a game if we play like this. And Tom Osborne after the game was like, hey, keep your head up this team is just that good. You're uh, not that bad. I was going to say, I bet he could see it on the other coach's face. Like, is this the way the season's going to go? Yeah. And that was his whole thing. He's yeah. like, I'm in trouble if this is like, but it, it speaks to how good Nebraska was. But yes. Lawrence Phillips went off in that game, like over 200 yards, but he gets suspended for some issues. And who did they plug in after Lawrence Phillips? No, I didn't. I didn't. Um, see exactly who they plugged in. I want to talk about oh, what. Oh, let me let me just finish this though, real quick. Yeah, they plugged in a freshman from Omaha named Amon Effing Green. Oh, okay. One of the best NFL running backs for like a five to seven year period with the Packers. I thought Green came in '96. That that's interesting. No, that Amon he... Green was a freshman in '95. Oh, okay, over a okay. thousand yards. How many touchdowns did he have? Sixteen touchdowns, I think. Just absolutely insane that's the stuff i love about researching this with dom is he just like corrects all he's the stat man (laughs) the stat man but it's one of those things where everybody thought lawrence was going to be he was going to have a season that people would talk about for generations and their their second string running back damon benning was suspended for off-field stuff yes we're just going to plug in amon green right now that's like (laughs) that's the thing that about this team was they were so deep i wonder how many other players that didn't necessarily get to play because there were so many great players they were probably starring on their 97 team yes. <laughs> <laughs> but no well, Fra- Frazier played the whole season yeah that's when Frazier plays the whole season and shows what a unbelievable quarterback he is because yeah that's... I mean he had a great uh 17 to 4 touchdown interception ratio yep. even though they're not throwing it a lot he's taking care of the ball running the ball very well out of the option attack I mean here's how dominant this team was their closest margin of victory was a 14 point two touchdown win over Washington State led by Ryan Leaf. That's insane. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, the the amount that they were beating teams by shows you because this is an era in which had some great other teams. Colorado was great. Colorado was was still good in 95 that they beat. um, Kansas state was finally coming up in the big, big eight soon to be big 12. I mean, I was going to say the Kansas state was ranked eight and then they beat Kansas later. So they pretty much Kansas was good in 95 too with Glenn Mason. Yes. So they pretty much were going through these teams, not like, it, it, the thing that blows my mind is how they were just like dismissing these teams who were great. It was like a hot knife through butter. Yes. I mean, 20 guys made first, second, or third team all Big 8. Yeah, I, I was started to list the guys making the... And this is when the Big 8 turns to the Big 12, is it not? In 96, name? yeah. In 96, oh, okay. Also, shout out to the 94 team as a baseball guy. Darren Erstad, their punter, was one of a 
one of the best pure hitters in the American League for the Anaheim Angels for an extended period. Yeah, I love the that he was a, a real punter. three. Yeah, he was the backup punter, or the junior punter, or whatever. No, he was a starting punter. Oh, okay. And he did some place kicking for him too. I mean, he was he wasn't just on the team. He, he was, was a guy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was a great athlete all around. That's something that you could show. And he didn't play uh, 95 because he decided to take Well, he the, was drafted in the first take, round that's by why, the Angels. Exactly. Yeah, you always take the money with baseball over football. Exactly. I mean, Kyler Murray may be a great football player, but it, his career wouldn't be as long if he had played for the A's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, you, it's interesting to think that this team was just so stacked with athletic talent, you know, top to bottom. Oh, yeah. And... He, this is how embarrassing it was. So Phillips, towards the end of the year, Osborne lets him back on the team. It's just putting kerosene on a fire, just ravaging the rest of college football. They go in to the Fiesta Bowl to play the University of Florida. Which, I mean, obviously, Florida, national the, championship, you got to go in. Florida, the fun and gun. They're undefeated. They're a, an exciting opposite offense to watch of Nebraska. They're throwing the ball around the yard with the old ball coach, Steve Spurrier. Yeah, they're they spreading go, it. Yeah. They go into that game and beat Florida 62 to 24. Yeah. It, it's it's such a like the the talent level was so much more than all these other teams. And Florida was number 2. Florida was looking like going into this game people thought Florida was really going to give them a a good Finally game. Finally give them a game yeah. and it was just a blowout. There's this one famous run you can look it up on YouTube. Tommy Fraser scores a touchdown from like around midfield and you can see the not want to in those florida defenders eyes they have him dead to rights and he just breaks through the grasp of a bunch of dudes in this pile and emerges and scores it's amazing well it's one of those things where they knew that they were going to win you know what i mean they yeah. had that on the like before going in there like there's no way they're even going to challenge us like they had that dick swinging confidence yes. that like it was it was absolutely insane yes and uh yeah, two two in a row. Two in a row and two so unbelievably dominant. So I think they went twenty five and zero, and they yeah. are they're the way that they are beating teams because they we've had teams do this before where they had two really good seasons where it's like a bunch of juniors and a bunch of seniors. Yeah. But these two teams and especially in ninety five were probably the greatest college football teams. They're definitely in that discussion. In that discussion, top three, you know, oh, maybe yeah. top, you know. But then we get into 96, where shit kind of goes off the rails. 96 is a weird year. I mean, you still have Green, but you lose Frazier. You lose Barringer to graduation, and he dies in a plane crash. I thought that was enough. wild. Yeah. yeah. And then a lot of the defensive pieces are gone, but you still have a good team. Yeah. I mean, you still have a really good team. But what happens is they win their first game. They're 26 in a row. Then they have to travel back to Tempe to do the home-and-home -home series they have with the Sun Devils. And I remember watching this game. I was nine. It was on that old Fox Sports channel. You remember that one? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Just want to take a quick break to uh, let you know that our Sports Experience podcast is brought to you by Engel Studio here. And uh, they're here in Tucson for all your recording needs. ASU that year went undefeated. And not only did they go undefeated, they kicked the piss out of nebraska which is crazy they beat them 19 to 0 it was their first shutout in decades yeah nebraska being shut out you i mean you had a great team you had jake Plummer at quarterback terry battle running the ball keith Poole catching the ball good offensive line great defensive players uh pat tillman was a linebacker yep. on that team i mean they had NFL quality on that ASU team, which is so rare. Yeah, the um, the energy in that stadium, if you watch that game again, yep. it is absolutely insane. And while ASU did everything right, Nebraska, just all of the wheels came off. Yeah, that was when you could tell, like, when the, the cohesion that they were showing in the 95 season, that's when you could absolutely tell that they just weren't playing for each other. Yeah, I mean, you had a lot of losses, but you still had a talented enough team because even after they lose to um, ASU, 
they run the table the rest of the way through the regular season. Yeah, that really kicked them in the ass to be like, hey, we're better than this. Why would we lose? Not not necessarily why would we lose to ASU, but why would we lose 19 nothing? Let's never have that happen again. Yeah, and I mean, they, they reeled off 10 straight or nine straight wins. Yep. The problem, and here's the thing about that was so interesting. The 96 college football season, we could do an entire episode on this, but the last weekend of the season, because it's now not the Big 8, it's the Big 12. Yeah, the Big 12. Up until 1996, the only conferences that had championship games was the SEC. Now the Big 12 has a championship game, and Nebraska has to play one more because they win the Big 12 North Division because you have it's all the old Big 8 teams in the Big 12 North. Uh, you have Colorado, Kansas State, Kansas, Iowa State, and then you also have Nebraska and Missouri. And Missouri. Nebraska kills all those teams. Yeah. Then they face Texas because the Big 12 is just the love child of the Texas and Oklahoma schools. Um, Oklahoma State was in the Big 8. But all the Texas and Oklahoma schools that were in the old Southwest Conference that are big schools. Texas comes out of the South. Texas has a good team. I mean, they win 10 games. They were unranked at the time, but they were still... They were still a, a viable team. Some people thought they should have been ranked. Yeah. That was something yeah. that I always find weird with the AP poll, but that's just the way it goes. And when you look at the history of the Big 12 championship game for as long as it lasted, it is the one with the most upsets, and this is the first one, and Texas ends up beating them. Yep. And I say that's important because heading into that last weekend of 96, Nebraska was ranked like fourth or fifth. Yeah. ASU is undefeated, but they have the Rose Bowl tie-in, so they're going. ASU f- runs the table before the Rose Bowl. They're in. They're in national championship contention. Ohio State, they're 10-0, and and they play Michigan, but they lose. They're ranked ahead of Nebraska. Yeah. They're not a national championship contention, but they had already been slotted in for the Rose Bowl. So Nebraska can jump Ohio State. Florida State, which was undefeated, beat number one undefeated Florida. Florida's ahead of Nebraska. Florida loses. If Nebraska beats Texas, they're playing for another national championship. I was going to say, we have just a ton of 11-1, and 10-1 and one teams. And if they beat Texas, that literally puts them in line to play whoever for... I mean, I, I don't even know who they would go up against. They would have gone Florida against State. Florida State because yeah. they would have been undefeated. Yeah. But what happens because Florida is ranked one and Nebraska loses that game, yep. Florida jumps back up and they get a right, the right to play for a national title against Florida State again in a rematch. And obviously Florida, which was number two the year before, finally breaks through yep. and Nebraska's left to play and just absolutely shellac Virginia Tech in the Orange Bowl. Yeah. Left wondering what if. But you still have a talent laden team. Yeah, I was I felt like that was the way in in this era of their great teams that was like their slight rebuild, especially with the ASU loss. Yeah, and you had Frazier being replaced by their now head coach Scott Frost at quarterback. Yes. And 97, you're still loaded, and they come out guns blazing in 97. I was going to say, 97 is um, Tom Osborne's last year. So it is, it, yeah. It's, it's a swan song. Yeah, it's one of those great uh, ends to a coaching career where in 97, they just pretty much show – they're definitely not as good as 95, but they show why they were great in 95, if and, that makes sense. The, yeah, their and, program and, really – excels and frost goes off that year yes. like he's finally comfortable he's a really great runner he had only 1200 yards passing but he had over a thousand yards rushing only that, green topped him on the roster in that regard that's something that the the way tom osborne ran his offense in that era i feel like nobody was looking for that running quarterback and he was just like okay i'll take him yeah, yeah. i'll take him and it, that's why i feel like with with frazier with frost it, it, it's it, it, he really is one of the better coaches with planning. They had 41 combined touchdowns that year. Yeah. Their offense ranked first, again, 46.7 points per game. Defense was 12th, still steady, 16.5 points per game. I mean, and they were number one for most of the season. However, in a mid-November game... I, I thought this was interesting. 
And I remember watching this. It's one of the best college football games I've ever watched. They go to Columbia to play Missouri on the road. And Missouri that year was a bowl team. They were pretty good. I actually watched that Missouri team play in the Tucson Insight Bowl here in town. They played West Virginia. They had a pretty good team. Missouri gives them everything that they can handle. And honestly, Missouri should have won that game. But there's a pass that Frost makes to win it into the end zone, into traffic, or the ball is kicked just like in a scrum to one of their wide receivers, Matt Davidson, for a touchdown. Yeah. But because that game was so close, Nebraska in the AP poll is jumped by undefeated Michigan. Because Michigan is blowing teams out. So and they, Michigan is also undefeated. So, and they don't Heisman have, Trophy winner, yeah, Charles Woodson. They don't have this uh, close game kind of thing. They're, they're, yeah. really, they're shellacking teams, so it's, it's obvious that jump kind of happens. And Nebraska, though, still maintains number one in the coaches' poll. Because this is the last year without the BCS. Yes. And, because and we can of, see why. <laughs> and yes, because of the way the bowl games work, Michigan has the automatic tie-in as Big Ten champion to the Rose Bowl. Nebraska in the Big Eight, champion always goes to the Orange Bowl. If, or the highest ranked team goes to the Orange Bowl. So they, they are essentially going to play two different bowls when they should be meeting up and playing each other. Exactly. And basically what ends up happening is both teams go to their bowl games. Michigan kind of ekes it out, but they but they win win a steady game against Ryan Leaf in Washington State. Yeah, and Nebraska goes down to Miami to play Tennessee. Tennessee's one loss because Peyton Manning could never beat Florida. That was his knock. Florida was his Tom Brady for yeah. the longest time. Tennessee, if they win that game, probably catches a share of the national championship. And they go down there, and Amon Green goes wild. And they win that game. And they win that game. And, and they win the coaches' national championship. Well, this is what I found um, interesting about college football and also frustrating about it from this era was you really didn't have a definite champion. You didn't have – so Michigan won the AP poll. They were number one with the rating or yeah. whatever you want to say. Um Nebraska won the coaches poll by like a lot. Like they almost had like twice as many coaches. I think it was like 12 to six or something like that. Yeah. Well, in 94, what ended up happening was that Penn State was 12 and 0. Nebraska won the, you know, they won the whole shebang bang, but Penn State had a dominant Rose Bowl win against Oregon with yeah. Kajana Carter and all those guys. Penn State should have played Nebraska in some sort of bowl game, but you had those conference tie-ins because yep. Penn State was in the Big Ten, Nebraska's in the Big Eight. So I think 1990, that was a split national championship. 1991, that was a split national championship with Miami and Washington. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because 1990 was Colorado and Georgia Tech. Mm-hmm. Um, 92, Alabama won it all. 93, Florida State won it all. 94, though, you had the two undefeated teams. 95, Nebraska won it all. 96, you could have made a case I was in 96 say, for five different teams being national champions, even they, though Florida won. If they thought 97 was a problem, 96 was ridiculous. 96, I think, was the year where everyone just threw their hands up. But 93 is a good example because had Notre Dame not lost their last week against Boston College, Notre Dame had beat Florida State, who had played Nebraska. Oh, yeah. Florida State's only loss was to Notre Dame, and Notre Dame went out and won the Cotton Bowl against an undefeated... No, no, the year before Texas A&M was undefeated, but A&M was a top-five team. So, like, 93 and 96 were finally the years where they started talking either BCS or playoff yeah, because it just had to happen. And They Nebraska, did BCS for a while, and now they're doing playoff, which I think is right, but what do you yeah, think? Top, oh, I love the format, to be honest. Me too. Because usually... 96 is just the anomaly, mm-hmm. but every year you can really tell who the top five teams are. Yes. and Or top four teams are. And normally, normally it's only three really deserve to be there. There's never an argument about number three. It's always the argument about number four. Number four. Yeah. And there's never really an outside argument like, oh, this team really missed out. It's like, no, that team really would have got... Yeah, exactly. You're right. It's it's really like the the top team plays a, a lesser team, and then two teams kind of go at it. I, I love the it got me back into college football because the bowl game is not confusing, but 
it takes away from the legitimacy of the championship it is my opinion oh i agree no i total i'm 100 percent on board um so three national championships in oh, yeah. four years they could have had five in a row yes if you think about it that's the thing that you look at they really could have had five or at least four out of five for sure with 93 yeah definitely i mean they were the early to mid 90s best college football team yeah yeah and, and it's absolutely insane but i wanted to get into one thing before we finish this podcast okay tell me and it is the off-field things that these teams were doing because they became known for it and it kind of tarnished osborne even though he's kind of teflon and shit doesn't stick to him they had some issues. Well, this is what I thought was curious about him retiring in 97 was, do you think that the culture of football changing kind of got him I think out? it did because yeah. he was kind of an autocrat. I mean, he, but he's so beloved in that state. He served in Congress. I after know. That. I saw that for six years or something and then came back and I think he's the AD of Nebraska now or something Yeah, like he's that. somehow involved with the program. I mean, something. he'll never go away. Tom yeah. Osborne Field, I mean, in Lincoln. Um, but I mean, he deserves it. He deserves it, definitely. But we're, t we're talking this era where the culture definitely changes. And I had brought it up earlier, and a lot of people point to this, is to compete even with Oklahoma in your own conference and to compete with, you know, the schools that are in Florida, you need to get the team speed. You need to get players, you know, who have some off-field issues who can help your team. Yeah. Osborne gave into that. And throughout the early 90s, you saw a lot of players in off field trouble, which Osborne, as this coach, was defending, but he was doing some kind of shady stuff behind the scenes. And there are some famous incidents that I found. Uh, January of 92, running back Scott Baldwin beat a woman, allegedly. He got off because he pled insanity. Yeah. The following fall, he was shot and paralyzed by cops during an arrest. Okay. So he might have been insane. So he might have been insane. It, I mean, it, there's a lot of these where Tom tries to not cover it up, but be like, oh, it, it's weird. Well, it fall of 93, Kenny Wilhite got in a car wreck that killed an 11-year-old girl driving recklessly. March of 94, Tyrone Williams, which I brought up. And this is one where people kind of point to Osborne as being a little bit, you know, a little bit too uh, friendly and helpful in situations where a court of law maybe could have settled it differently. Apparently, allegedly, Williams fired a gun into the car of a former Nebraska safety, uh, Kevin Porter, who played for the Jets at the time. Mm -hmm. Got in some legal trouble. Osborne and one of his assistants talked to Williams and allegedly, and it's been documented, hid the firearm that he used to fire in that car he hid the he hit the guy's 22 yeah he pretty much covered up yeah i mean he was under the the guys and this is definitely football boys will be boys it was and it was one of those things where he was like i don't want this player to get suspended over some bullshit like this but it was like a feeding into this culture of like these guys can they do can what, do anything yeah whatever they want and his defense for that which i find kind of weak is well, if we kick them off the team and they have no structure, they'll be doing worse things. And it's like, but look what the hell they're doing. I was going to say the lack of structure is what's really causing these. They're you almost need, you lashing need to get out. your structure in order to get these guys under control. Yep. The most famous one, though, there are two more that I want to talk about. This one is the most famous one, and it's Lawrence Phillips. Yeah. But this is a weekend shit show for Nebraska. Friday... The, we, the day before they played the Michigan State game, uh, September 8, 1995, wide receiver Riley Washington is alleged to have committed a second-degree murder in a uh, convenience store shooting. He's later acquitted, but Osborne keeps him on the team throughout all of this mess. Yeah. And acquitted, that's fine, okay? That's fine. Good for him. I feel bad for him that he had to go through that process if he didn't do it. But there's whispers and things like that that he may or may not have murdered these people. Yes, and I, got I, off with what what people think is like a technicality. Kind of got off with um, 
and I hate to say it, but like OJ style where it was pretty obvious that it was yeah. him, but they really couldn't. And Osborne was known to want to talk to witnesses. Oh, yes. And by talk to witnesses, it's almost maybe witness intimidation. Yes, influence witnesses. Yes, influence witnesses. Mm -hmm. So that Saturday, their backup running back I mentioned, Damon Benning, which allowed him on green to play, he's suspended for allegedly beating a woman. Saturday, September 9th, they play Michigan State in Shellac, and Lawrence Phillips goes off. On the flight home, Osborne says he always regrets this, that he never invited Phillips back home for dinner at his place. Oh, okay. Just to cap it off. But Phillips said, no, I have plans with my girlfriend at the time, on again, off again, Kate McEwen, who was on the basketball team. Yeah. He wants to go home to see her and go on a date and just have a relaxing Saturday. When they get back from East Lansing to, or when they get back to Lincoln from East Lansing, he finds out Kate McEwen is partying somewhere else at the apartment of their backup transfer quarterback, Scott Frost. Who is now their coach. I don't even know if we brought that up. Yes, he's now yeah. their head coach. He's of now the, their head coach. To have this spider off in so many ways. Frost can't play. He's a Nebraska native, but he can't play because he had transferred from Stanford. Because, so he has a, a year off. Yeah, because he at the time, Bill Walsh had got a lot of good quarterback recruits. So like at the time, they had Steve Stenstrom had just left. Mark Butterfield, Tim Carey, who later played at Hawaii. Um, and Frost was kind of like, all right, I'm not going to get a chance to play. I'm just going to go to Nebraska. Yeah, and Frost is a great quarterback. That's why Nebraska was like, yes, we will take yeah, you. Yeah, we'll and, take you. Yeah, and made you for a come year. home. Yeah. yeah. So they're there. Phillips knocks on the door. Nobody answers. Everything is fine. Whatever. There's silence for a while. He scales the building and goes through the balcony door into the apartment. Now, there's conflicting things about what happened regarding Frost. Yeah. Frost says Phillips choked him and put him up against the wall and subdued him and then went after McEwen. Phillips' version is Frost wanted none of him and barricaded himself and left McEwen to deal with Phillips. He barricaded himself in the bathroom. And what ended up happening was Lawrence Phillips, who had probably one of the most traumatic childhoods of anybody that I've researched as far as having a neglectful mom, brought numerous men into the house who were abusive, one of whom pissed on him when he was a kid. Yeah, he, he had one of those stories um, of child abuse where you're just like, God, just stop the stories. Like it, He hernandez himself in prison before Hernandez. He murdered yeah. a guy in prison, yeah. allegedly. I mean, but he really takes it out on this ex-girlfriend of his, beats her to a pulp, drags her by her hair down three flights of stairs in her apartment, and shoves her head into a, bashes her face into a mailbox. Yeah, he like lobby. really it, disgustingly beats her to like, to an extent where you're just like, this guy needs serious, serious help. And his jail sentence wasn't very long. Not Osborne keeps all. him on the team. Yeah. And he was the top talent going into that 96 draft. Oh, yeah. Funny story about this, and I'll always remember this from my childhood. The Rams had an unhappy Jerome Bettis at the time who their coach was trying to phase out. They see Lawrence Phillips. They want to draft Lawrence Phillips despite all all of the casserole of madness that comes along with him. Yeah. And for second and fifth round picks, they trade Jerome Bettis in one of the dumbest trades ever to the Pittsburgh Steelers for Lawrence Phillips. For Lawrence Phillips. Yeah. It, it's that one's interesting. The, the way that stuff goes. I mean, obviously we all know what um, Bettis does in, you know, but perfect running back for that city. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, workhorse but it's one of those things where like we we see the end of the boys will be boys era because the beating the shit out of the women is the thing that football constantly were turning their backs on and being like not even like uh suspending these guys no you know what i mean like and that's the thing that really comes to light with a lot of these players is they really we're pieces of shit in this era, you know? Well, and I have one more because I have oh, to okay. get to it. And it because it's just as messed up as Phillips. They had a defensive lineman on their team named Christian Peter. Played from 91 to 95, one of those fifth-year senior type of players. All right. From 91 to 93, when he first got there, he was arrested eight times. 
eight times. Jesus. Now I looked at the arrests. Some of them are very, um, some of them are very benign, like pissing in public, minor in possession. You know, stuff a normal college kid would get into. I, I can say. overlook that. I've been dumb and a late teenager before. Yeah, I've done ridiculous, not criminal things, but stupid shit like this. Yeah, the peeing in public and just crap where you're just kind of feel like you're above authority. But in 1995, a student named Kathy Redmond said in 1991 he apparently raped her two times. Jesus. Not only did he do that, he grabbed, after that, he grabbed a woman's crotch in a crowded bar. He allegedly abused, sexually assaulted a former Miss Nebraska while he was there. Jeez. And this is one of those instances where Osborne wanted to come in and have everybody hash stuff out internally, not, not in a court of law. Which is bullshit. But which that is was, total garbage. It's just the way, it's the... The boy, and I keep bringing it up because it's that mentality of let's it, keep this in house and sweep it under the rug. And he was the heartbeat of that defense, and that's why he gets to stay. That's what I mean. They and he was very do, talented. They and, wouldn't do it for a second stringer. And in the '96 draft, what happens? Everybody starts passing on the guy. Oh yeah. Until the fifth round, when a certain team, led by a certain owner, who likes to frequent. Uh, under the radar massage establishments named Robert Kraft and the Patriots decide to roll the dice. And he took so much flack him in the organization for drafting him from not only the fan base, but his own wife Mm -hmm. that they cut him before training camp even started. Well, if anybody's going to roll the dice on somebody mentally unstable, it's the Pats. Oh, absolutely. It's the Pats, baby. But he ended up playing five years in the league for the giants. And it's insane to think that this boys will be boys attitude that you had mentioned was fostered. Oh, and everyone seems to look at those teams now at the time they would always look at all the off field stuff, but now that's kind of been lost to history, but finally we're living in an era, which I think is a good thing where stuff like that isn't acceptable or swept under the rug anymore. Yeah. Like, obviously, some of these were alleged type of things, but some of these things actually happened. Yeah, it's one of those things where you have so many instances that it, they can't be fabricated. And, that's, and not fabricated anymore because you have social media and oh, things yeah. like that. Like, I can't even imagine what it was like back in the day. Yeah, and that's the thing is with a couple of these guys and a couple of these instances that we probably will never hear about. Yeah. That's the thing. These are the things that we're hearing about. I wonder about what Tom Osborne kind of swept under the rug. Nothing um, against him as a football coach, but I feel like his judgment in a lot of these uh, um, instances were just extremely poor. And, and you know what? If these guys react negatively to being um, punished yeah. or having consequences for their actions, that's on them. You at least did the right thing. He walked out of a press conference after the Lawrence Phillips thing and a media member asked him, if this was your wife or your daughter, do you think you'd be reacting this way? Yeah. And he just got up and left. He didn't even answer the guy. He well, said, I don't have to answer this question. That's the the take. That's the take. The thing that is not in his favor is that he puts football above everything else. He and puts, he did. Yeah. And I'll say, I'll say this. By putting football above everything, you win three national championships. Yes. That's, I mean, I but, hate to say it, but yeah, because there's extra. There's extra. There's always extra. I wonder what the Royd situation was because 90s college football was pretty rampant. But. Well, when you look at the size of some of these Nebraska linemen and how they, a lot of them washed out in the pros, yep. I think some of that may have factored in in addition to their rigorous weight training program. It's one of those things where everybody was using it, so I don't think it was necessarily an unfair advantage. No. But man. They were so ridiculously jacked. So jacked, and the teams were so good. Yeah, they really were. That's something that you can't really take away from. The teams were great, and some of them were pieces of shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Much like any team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To be honest, I mean, you have a, a an entire group of people. They're not going to all be, you know, any any group that you get. And I'll say this. This isn't limited to Nebraska, Colorado was built in almost the exact same way to be good during this era. 
and a lot of teams were Miami, Florida, yes. Florida State. I mean, overlook the negative that some players may have because they are so great on the field. Exactly. That is. I feel like that is the era of that. It know? is. It's the last of the era. Yeah. Too. It's the last. We, get, of we it. get that death rattle because now social media just kills that. In which um, that's some. I, don't really like social media all that much, but I love the accountability that people have now with it. Yes, exactly. I mean, it can go overboard at times, but yes, it can, you know, maybe you help people by canceling them like a Lawrence Phillips. Yes. Not for what what they say, but what they actually do. Yes. Yeah. You know how I feel about canceling comics. I hate that shit. Same here. For somebody's actual actions, they deserve to be canceled. Right. And And I will back that a million times. Mm -hmm. And that's the Sports Experience Podcast. I'm Chris Quinn. I'm Dom DiTola, brought to you here over at Engel Studio in Tucson for all your recording needs. Thank you all very much. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to that podcast. This is just a stock message at the end of all of our podcasts, so we hope you enjoy. You listen to whatever athlete that was. Give us a follow at the Sports Experience Podcast on Instagram. Also, myself at Sequin Comedy on Instagram. Also, Totola Dominic on Instagram. Just follow us all around. If you have any suggestions for any athletes you want us to do, shoot us an email at the Sports Experience Podcast at gmail.com. And we always are recording right here at Angle Studio. Thank you all very much.